churches of Christ. Tonight's lesson, in a way, is a sequel to this afternoon. If you heard this, the one this afternoon, you'll understand that better as we develop this one. This afternoon, the church of our Lord is not a denomination. At that time, we discussed passages in the Bible that uh, reveal on the part of evil men a sectarian attitude that we can find in our midst today. Then we presented about 11 ways that we could become a denomination ourselves, and some of which seem to be uh, already within the thinking of a lot of brethren. Tonight we come to discuss church growth, both good and bad. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3.18, but grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And yet, that growth is not necessarily numerical growth. Some congregations that have very few members are exceedingly strong spiritually. Some that have thousands of members are very weak spiritually. By their fruits you shall know them. Matthew 7, verse 16 and verse 20. In Acts chapter 2, verse 41 and 47, we learn that human hands do not touch the growth of the church anyway. The Lord adds the saved to the church, such as should be added, he adds. He keeps the roll book. In fact, in Revelation 3, verses 1 to 5, we learn that he sometimes blots names out of the Lamb's book of life that he himself had entered there. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 and 7, we read that God gives the increase. It's our task, our privilege, to plant and water, and God gives the increase. I really have often wondered about brethren to have a little black book in which they can tell you exactly how many people they've baptized. Sometimes they'll say, I baptized 2,000 and I restored 4,000. I don't know that that would be possible on that last paper. And a lot of people that we've ducked in water, the Lord may not have added. He keeps the roll book. He keeps account of church growth. And it's our job, according to the Great Commission, to preach the gospel. And then honest men and the Lord will tend to the rest. I don't appreciate brethren who send preachers out in difficult fields and the only question they ask them at the end of each year is, how many did you baptize? The Lord didn't say go into all the world and baptize everybody. He said go teach everybody. We need to equip men with the ability to reach the lost, teach the lost, and then honest men and God will take care of the rest. Sometimes preachers say, I, I quit that work because I didn't baptize enough people. Now, that's thinking in a sectarian way. I hope that I can say some things tonight that will make us understand that God doesn't see everything like we do. In the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, and the more I study those first three chapters of Revelation, the more I believe I know why brethren don't read Revelation more. It isn't because they can't understand it, it's because they can understand it, and it's embarrassing. Those are the bluntest, most straightforward chapters you ever saw. It's very significant that of the seven congregations to whom the book was addressed, the two most pompous, flamboyant, bombastic, were rebuked the sternest. The one, the Lord said, you have a name that you live, but you're dead. Revelation 3, verse 1. To the other, he said, you make me sick. Chapter 3, verse 14 and following. The two most inconspicuous congregations, Smyrna, deeply, intensely persecuted, and Philadelphia, a little congregation in a little town, were nonetheless praised by the Lord as being successful and faithful with an open door that God would provide that no man could shut. Wouldn't be surprised but what some brethren in the first century stood back and said, aren't those churches at Sardis and Laodicea great and powerful and strong? And those poor little old country congregation, weak and insipid at Smyrna and Philadelphia, that's not what the Lord said. That alone ought to teach us something. Just like Jesus riding in on a donkey instead of a prancing white horse or a black stallion. Mark chapter 11, Zechariah chapter 9 ought to teach us something. Do you remember what Paul said in Galatians chapter 2? He said, those that claim to be somewhat added nothing to me. Every word in the Bible is there for a purpose. I like the way that's worded. Those who seem to be somewhat, they just seem to be. In Mark chapter 12, we've overlooked the major point in the story of the widow and her mites. You ever read that carefully, that whole section? 
Jesus stood over against the treasury and saw how the people gave. See with the Lord, attitude and motive is the important thing. How they gave. John the Immerser, who was in the baptizing business, refused to baptize some people. We have some brethren today who rebuke us saying, you have no right to refuse to baptize anybody. Well, John was in the baptizing business, and he refused to. He said, not until you bring forth fruit worthy of repentance will I attend to your request. Read Matthew chapter 3. I know that Paul didn't believe in phenomenal numerical growth as being the criteria of success because I've read the sermon he preached to Felix. Out of all the points he could have chosen, and some of our psychologically oriented brethren would have said, you need to be wiser and choose better timing. You know, Mission Magazine several years ago rebuked Stephen for being so ignorant that he made the people so mad to kill him. If he had been smooth and suave, he'd live a lot longer, they said. If I've ever read blasphemy, there it is. Well, Paul was converted partially, probably more than just partially by Stephen. His sermon and his greatness and his Christ likeness. And so when Felix came to hear him preach, though Paul was in prison, instead of saying in a rationalizing way like some of us do, I'll preach three positive truths that won't offend him. So I can psychologically build up to a plain gospel sermon. He said, I know I can't preach those three points that keep coming back to me because he wouldn't like that. And I might stay in prison. He might kill me. Paul didn't think that way. He chose the three most needed points and preached them straightforwardly and made the man tremble. Righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come to an unrighteous, uncontrolled, hell-bound individual. He was more interested in spiritual growth and absolute conversion than adding another number to the roll, his role. He knew if the man were honest, he'd obey the truth and the Lord would add him to his church. I really believe that it is in this area we have changed more in the last 10 years than every other area put together except moral principles. We've apostatized more in worldliness than any other realm and secondly in our attitudes and concepts of church growth. Some preachers have a deep longing to preach for a great, big, famous congregation. I'm glad Philip left the multitudes in Samaria and went to preach to one man, aren't you? I'm glad he didn't think like a lot of folk do today. Maybe he had read 1 Samuel 16, 7. God doesn't look on the outward appearance but upon the heart. Maybe he had read Joel 2, 13, where that fearless prophet said, Rend your hearts and not your garments. Is it possible, brethren, that we have actually violated the intent and content of that verse, Joel 2.13? By our convenient response method, sometimes wish that we never had printed up those little white cards we hand to people that respond. And we even have it so convenient they can put a check mark in the right box and just sit there like a dodo bird. And then the priest will pray them through and everything will be all right. Now that may be overdrawing it a little bit, but it's just a little bit. Here's a man and his wife that should have settled things at home. They don't even settle things at church building. She comes here and he comes there and they don't even speak on the way out and probably fight when they get home again. But they're, they repented and they've been restored and they're all right because they came forward. Question. Where is the emphasis in the Bible on the invitation song? It isn't there. Where is the inordinate emphasis on external public responses? You won't find it. The purpose of Christianity is an everlasting response of the life to the Lord and that forever. And people that come forward six or seven times a year never have been taught properly. The elders, Bible teachers, and preachers. We need to be converted once and for all. Take a stand and never look back. If you put your hand to the plow and look back, you're not fit for the kingdom of God, Luke 9, 62. It needs to be constant as we press on toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, Philippians 3.14. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I think of what Paul said in the synagogue of Antioch of Pisidia. You talk about a man that wasn't interested in numerical growth. He wasn't too interested in physical life. How would you like to say this to a synagogue full of Jews? 
through Christ is preached in you the forgiveness of sins. And those things you could not be forgiven of by the law of Moses, you can be justified from through him. Did that inflame their passion? They wanted to kill him. So he said, seeing you thrust the word of God from yourselves and count yourselves unworthy of eternal life, lo, I turn to Gentiles. That wasn't very good psychological poise. It was true. The last chapter of the book of Acts, he says to the religious leaders of the Jewish community of Rome who come to hear him preach, you close your eyes, shut your ears, harden your heart. Lo, I turn to Gentiles. He just told the truth. They need to hear the truth. He wasn't there to win friends and influence people, a la Dale Carnegie. He was there to save souls. But some of my brethren, in their quest for numerical growth, for external thickness, overlooked some Bible principles. And so they look for preachers who can preach in such a nebulous way that their friends can come in lost and go out lost and never know the difference. They want a preacher that's kind of like an after-dinner speaker at the Rotary Club Friday noon. He has about 13 jokes per sermon, one or two illustrations. Uh, he's great. They want him to be like a professional baseball pitcher, wind up and throw a curve around everybody in the house. They don't want him to preach on heaven or hell because they've got too many friends in both places. Because we've got to grow numerically, don't you know? The greatest church I ever preached for had 26 people that came every time the doors open. And every single one of them showed up for personal work, too. There were 27 that belonged there, and he only came every time the doors opened. He wouldn't do personal work. Poor old wicked, sinful thing. 26 out of 27, wouldn't it be great if we're, quote, the church is so strong? We had that kind of ratio. That's the strongest church I ever saw. Weakest one I ever saw is the largest one I ever preached for. They had lots of money. Fancy building in a ritzy location. We were somebody. They thought. Church growth. Now, in order to get all the church growth we want, we even have to water down plain, specific preaching that we've been doing for 50 years on record. And all of a sudden we change. Why? I'm now quoting one of the four leading teachers of error on marriage, divorce, and remarriage within our brotherhood. Thirty-five preachers and elders were present the same day that I was present to hear this man speak. Here was his opening statement. We paint ourselves in a corner of evangelism, brethren, with our teaching on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. So pretty soon we won't have anybody to preach to because you knock on any door and about every other door has adultery in it or has people living differently than we've always said they need to live according to God's marriage laws. He said, that bothered me. He said, it put me in a traumatic state. And I went to my office, just sat there in the chair and looked out the window until I learned of this teaching. And I, I studied and Doug, and he should have said, searching for something to confirm what I hoped was there. Now notice, we paint ourselves into a corner of evangelism when we teach what we've always taught on marriage, divorce, remarriage, and we'll just have to get over in a corner and stand together, I guess. I've always painted myself in a corner when I preach on baptism for remission of sin. There are very, very few people in the world like that, but I've still got to preach it. I get even in a smaller corner in a bigger room when I preach what the Bible says on music and worship. Well, there's not hardly anybody who believes that. And then if I get down there and become so narrow that I say we ought to have the Lord's Supper each first day of the week and have unleavened bread and fruit of the vine in it instead of light bread and water like the Mormons do, boy, there's hardly any room left in that corner, but I've got to still teach the truth. Am I so interested in numerical growth when I don't even control that anyway that I would compromise the truth of Almighty God if so, I must be beginning on a wrong premise. And of course, we've got to entertain the young people to hold them, somebody said. Strongest group of young people I ever saw, spiritually and numerically. We didn't give them a single donut or a single Dr. Pepper. We didn't take them six flags over Texas or skiing in the wintertime. You know what we did? We challenged them to study their Bible and teach their friends and bring them and convert them and marry faithful Christians. And now several out of that group are gospel preachers married to godly people. 
And we didn't have one ounce of entertainment in that congregation for the young people. See, that's the work of the parents, of the home, and of the church. We didn't have a single youth director. We never went to a youth rally. Not a one. Never announced one. They didn't even know they had such. I sure was glad. We just tried to be the church of the Lord, whether you were 14 or 40, 50 or 100. We were not so interested in what people call growth that we compromise truth. And I'm telling you, a lot of brethren through the days have. And then, of course, we didn't even got to entertain them while we entertained them. We got to give them a puppet show. You take the Kool-Aid and cookies and arts and crafts and paper dolls and puppets out of most, and bus programs and lollipops out of most programs, you might, you'd save about $10,000 a year plus and send people to spread the gospel around the world, and that's genuine growth there. It really, to me, has become a serious matter. When people are afraid that we paint ourselves into a corner when we teach the truth, that's the kind of corner to be in. Just teach the truth and let the Lord take care of the rest, the Lord and honest men. What if the man who sowed the seed in the parable of the sower, and that's all it says, a man sowed the seed, well, he said, we've got to get a new system. Only one out of four uh, came good. We're going to have to preach a different thing, so three out of four at least will obey. Who obeyed it? Those with good and honest hearts. Same seed sown to everybody. If we believe the first parable we ever taught, the parable of the sower, we'd understand what church growth ought to be, because those were parables about the kingdom, the church. But I'll tell you the parable Jesus taught about the church that I never hear anybody mention. In fact, I believe if I asked you to write down the 30 parables of the Bible, that would be the least known of all the parables of Christ. Out of 30, recorded Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the parables of the New Testament, this is going to be the lesser known of all, and I'll tell you why. It cuts the grain of what we want to believe. We don't think like that. That's why the Lord gave us a parable. It's a parable of the mustard seed. In Matthew 13, tiny, inauspicious, insignificant, couldn't even see it. But under God's sovereignty, his direction, his power, his arrangement, it grew and grew and covered the whole earth. Quietly, without fanfare, no beating of the drums, no bandwagons to jump on, but the church grew. By the power of God. The seed of the kingdom is the word of God, Luke 8, 11. Not sophistication, not humanism, not secularism, not hedonism. The seed of the kingdom is the word of God. And if you and I believe that, we'll cut out some of the funny business and just go back to the gospel, God's power to save. Romans 1, 16. Have you ever analyzed apostasy, even recent apostasy in church history? Let's talk about Alexander Campbell a minute. We talked a little bit about the principle of trying to restore the restoration movement. That's sectarianism. Did you know that Alexander Campbell was the first president of the Missionary Society? That's bad enough, but you know why he became such? He began to reason in the following way. The Lord told the church to preach the gospel to every creature in every nation. But God didn't equip the church to do what he told the church to do. That's really blasphemy. That's worse than, worse than sacrilege. So we've got to have an amalgamated effort, a super structured organizational system to do what the Lord told the church to do but didn't furnish the church the equipment with which to do it. Now, let's see what's wrong with that before we proceed. Everyone listening? All things that pertain to life and godliness have been revealed, 2 Peter 1.3. All scriptures give them inspiration of God, and he goes on to say, will make us complete, furnish us completely in every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Now, the Book of Mormon in 2 Nephi 29 says, Thou fool, that shall say a Bible, we've got a Bible, and we need no more Bible. That's the way they reason, and they'd have to, to be Latter-day Revelation people. But for folk who believe that God revealed his will, by the Holy Spirit, through the apostles, 
all truth revealed in their lifetime in the first century, John 16, 13, would have to conclude that whatever God told us to do in every realm, he equipped us through his word to do it. But Campbell didn't believe that. And many of his fellows didn't believe it. And so the Missionary Society, in direct opposition to the simple plan of organization of the Church of the Lord, was engendered by man, promulgated by man, and resulted in apostasy. Do you ever study the beginning of Mohammedanism? I've taught history. In fact, I majored in secondary education and minored in history because I thought the time might come, brethren, wouldn't pay me to preach what I believe was right, so I'd be ready to teach school or, or mow yards or something. And as a result, about a third of my library has always been history books. I was looking through a great world history book called Scaling the Century several years ago, and on page 71, I found out that when Mohammed started, he only had three members. And after five years, he only had 11, all of them were kin to him. He kind of browbeat them. So he sat down one day and decided, if this thing's going to grow, I've got to change things. So he quit being a moralist. He quit being strict. He quit calling for purity of life. In fact, and here's a direct quote, he said, from now on, every loyal Arab that dies in my service will have 42 black-eyed maidens to await his every sensual desire in utopia, unquote. Boy, it took off. It grew by leaps and bounds. Are we going to become so shallow? We're building gymnasiums now to appeal to the athletic in our midst. We're wasting the Lord's money on paraphernalia that has nothing to do with the spread of the gospel of Christ. And yet the Bible says, few there be that find it. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. <laughs> Only eight entered the ark. 1 Peter 3, 20. One of the leading words in the Old Testament prophets, and those of you who've read know what I'm talking about, is the word remnant. Not majority, not multitudes, but remnant. A handful of faithful. Why should we believe, as Bible believers, that our day would be any different? Exodus 23, 2, Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. So we ought to ask, as Jeremiah 37, 17, Is there any word from the Lord? And as 1 Peter 4, 11 endorses, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracle of God. Have you ever read Psalm 19, verses 13 and 14 carefully? We know verse 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. That emphasizes motives, attitudes, emphasis. But the verse before it says, keep back thy servant from presumptuous sin. Let me not be guilty of the great transgression. And it goes all the way back to Adam and Eve there. The great transgression came about by human presumption. Are we no longer going to say, we too must ask, what does the Lord say about a matter before we do it? Is that only for denominational people on baptism and worship and organization? What if we do paint ourselves in the corner by telling the truth? standing for the truth. The Lord will be there. These are some principles that I believe we need to think seriously about. David was rebuked in 2 Samuel 24 for numbering the people, trying to believe that their strength would lay in numbers, would reside in numerical growth. In Judges 7 verse 2, at reducing Gideon's army, that was already outnumbered at least five to one when it was at, at its fullest, down to 300 against, do you know how many? 135,000 Midianites. He reduced his army down to 300 to go against 135,000 Midianites, and he said, I've done this so that when the battle is won, you'll never say by my own strength and my own power we have done this. Our very approach to church growth is embedded in that concept. Do we believe that we're going to overwhelm the devil because we can line up more numbers than some denomination does? I remember when it became very 
famous among brethren to build cathedrals. When we went to the other extremes with little white box buildings across the tracks, here is a direct documented statement from Lubbock, Texas. When the largest building by far that Brethren had ever built, up to that time, most expensive, and now it'd just be a drop in a bucket. You know what they said? We've got to have this to keep up with the Baptist and Methodist. Keep up with them in what? Did the Lord say go into all the world and build buildings on Main Street? No. He said go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Brethren will go to the bank and borrow $2 million to build a gymnasium. They won't go to the bank and borrow 5000 to send a preacher around the world to proclaim the glad tidings. We're thinking exactly like the devil wants us to in sectarian ways. What is the power of Christianity? The gospel of Christ is God's power to save. Romans 1, 16. And if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. 2 Corinthians 4, 3. And we hide it behind recreational pursuits. Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9, 16. We've been put in trust with the gospel. 1 Thessalonians 2, 4. Anybody can outbuild us on gymnasiums. Anybody can have better eats to bribe people with. We're not in that business. In Jeremiah 9, 3, we have a perfect verse. We're strong in the land, but not for truth. Jeremiah 5, 1, God said, uh, Jeremiah, would you search throughout Jerusalem and see if you can find one man of integrity whom I can use? You talk about Abraham not being able to find ten and Sodom and Gomorrah. Jeremiah couldn't find one that would serve the Lord. In fact, Jeremiah only had one friend. I had a friend of mine once after I studied Jeremiah and taught it. And he's my favorite character in the Old Testament. This fellow came up to me and said, you remind me a lot of Jeremiah. And I said, thank you a lot. And he said, he never had any responses either. So <laughs> that may be about the only way I'm like it. <laughs> but Jeremiah just had one friend, and that was Baruch. And he had to rebuke him in chapter 45 of the book. How, in view of all these Bible teachings, can we ever come to the point that we accept the theme growth at any price? Growth numerically regardless of the cost. I'll be honest with you, when I first started preaching 32 years ago, I never, ever thought I'd have to talk to my brethren on these points. Gimmicks, gadgets, paraphernalia, or beneath the dignity of New Testament Christianity. God said, My word shall not return to me void, it shall accomplish that for which I have sent it. Isaiah 55, 11. The greatest among you shall be servant of all. Matthew 23, 1 to 12. And if we'd spend the next 20 years being devoted servants of Christ and preaching his word and letting God give the increase, we'd get something done. Now, brethren, I want you to listen to me while I make an application of that. I believe the greatest weakness among us, those of us who are conservatives, those of us who are narrow-minded, according to others, those of us who are kind of radicals, those of us who don't mind kind of getting out there on a limb let someone cut it off, our greatest weakness is we are not evangelistic enough. We spend too much time saying what's wrong, what's wrong, and not doing enough evangelizing. There are enough people in this town that this congregation could reach for the Lord, lost souls, that you could begin teaching properly and educate them biblically and indoctrinate them spiritually to where this building will be overflowing. People standing around the walls, out in the foyer, out in the street. It isn't enough to say liberalism's bad and the devil's tactic and shame on them. If we believe what we're saying tonight, we'll get busy with the gospel. And of all the people that ought to be training people to preach the truth, we're the ones. Every congregation that stands for something ought to have some kind of preacher training program going on at all times. And I mean by that, I don't mean on a, quote, brotherhood-wide basis. I'm talking about within the local congregation, the preacher training two or three, a half a dozen men to preach the word. 
so we can share with our brethren and with the world these biblical concepts of genuine church growth. Oh, there's so many things I'd like to say. But I want now to talk about proper goals and concepts that we should grow in. Before I do, I want to make this statement that I've made in every school of preaching where I've taught. I've taught hundreds and hundreds of men. A statement that as far as I know, I've made up, but I think it's a good one. Convenience is the mother of apostasy. I believe that's true. It's more convenient not to practice church discipline. It's more convenient to entertain the young people. Everybody else does. It's more convenient to let things slide. And that also is the open door to apostasy. It takes courage and heart and dedication and commitment to keep apostasy out. Now here are the three areas in which the church needs to grow. At least these three. First, in the likeness of Christ. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the length and breadth and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, being filled with all the fullness of God. Ephesians 3, 17 and 19. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians 1, 27. You are complete in Christ. Colossians 2, 10. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Colossians 3, 16 and 17. Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. John 6, 68. If any have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Romans 8, 9. Let the mind of Christ be in you. Philippians 2, 5. We must grow in the likeness of Christ. But having said that, we've got to explain the ramifications of that principle. Is it not the likeness of Christ to rebuke error? He did. And yet, as sure as you do, some member of the church say, you're not Christ-like. You're not loving and gentle. You're harsh and vindictive and unloving. Ephesians 5, 11, though, says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Jesus said to the religious elite of his day, the Sadducees, you do greatly hurt not knowing the scriptures, neither the power of God. Mark 12, 24. In Matthew 23, he said to the Pharisees, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Your house is left you desolate. Matthew 23, 38. We need to grow in that likeness of Christ. There is a firmness, a sternness against error in the life of Christ that a lot of my brethren have overlooked. I've been in a few public debates. I didn't seek a single one of them, but I didn't run from them either. The Bible tells us to be ready always, 1 Peter 3, 15. To contend earnestly for the faith, Jude, verse 3. But every single time, members of the church say, I don't believe in debating. I won't be there. Well, they don't believe in Christ. He debated the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Herodians, and everybody else who got in the way of truth. And Proverbs 25, 9 says, Debate thy cause with thy neighbor. That's Bible-like. That's Christ-like. That's God-like. We need to grow in the likeness of Christ in that dimension, too. We need to be kind every time we have an opportunity. We need to be firm always, loyal to God, loving truth, in love with the souls of men. The church needs to grow in the likeness of Christ. Jesus said, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? We're going to be like Christ and demand obedience, even on marriage, divorce, and remarriage? He did. He said, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Matthew 19, 6 through 9. And in Malachi 2, 16, we read emphatically, God hates divorce. Are we going to be godlike and hate divorce? Are we just going to sweep it all under the rug and fill the church with adulterers? Growing in the likeness of Christ has a lot of dimensions to it some people have overlooked. In fact, let me tell you the two things that pose our biggest problem in the church tonight. 
Number one, people don't know the Bible, so they don't even know what they're talking about. Secondly, they don't know what Christ was really like in the first place. They believe in a phantom that they dreamed up and someone who never lived. And that's another reason people don't read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They don't like what they see there. Psychologically, the reason people don't read the Bible is they find out they're in error and they don't like to find that out, so they just plead ignorance. What was Jesus really like? If we knew, it transformed the church overnight. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for yourself and jot down the dimensions of his life that you didn't know could be found there. And then believe in the Christ you read about instead of the one you dreamed up. Pictured effeminately in portraits, hair down his back. There's enough passages in the Bible for even the casual person to know that's not right. Secondly, and I don't have time to delve into this fully. I've already mentioned part of it, but I have time to say a few things. We need to grow in world evangelism. Here's the book of Acts. 3,000 added on the day of Pentecost. Of course, there were probably 2 million there, history tells us. Acts 4, 4, 5,000 more men were added. Acts 5, 14, more than ever, believers were added to the Lord. Acts 6, 7, a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Acts 12, 24, the word of God grew and multiplied. Acts 14, they so spake boldly that a great company or a great multitude believed. Acts 5, 28, they filled all Jerusalem with that doctrine. Acts 5, 42, daily in the temple and from house to house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Acts 17, 6, here come those men who turned the world upside down. Acts 19, verse 20, mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Romans 1, 18, their sound went out in all the earth. Colossians 1, 6, all the earth has heard the gospel preached. And here we sit with far more men, money, means of transportation, media communications, and we haven't even covered Muskogee, Oklahoma with the gospel, the east side of Muskogee, Oklahoma with it. My brethren, such things ought not so to be. And they won't be when we really believe the gospel is God's power to save. Last of all, and embedded in all of this, the church desperately needs to grow in spiritual depth. I'm ashamed of how little so many members of the church know. Some of them have been going to Bible study for 40 years, and they still don't even know the books of the Bible. The events of the Bible, the characters of the Bible, and the passages in the Bible that teach what men must do to be saved. If I wasn't for the telephone, I don't know what we'd do. But they say, wait a minute, I don't know that, but I'll call the preacher. He may have gone fishing. I know some preachers that barely know Acts 2.38. They know Bonhoeffer and Tillich and C.S. Lewis. And I'm telling you, too, you'd think that fellow wrote the Bible and it would answer to him the day of judgment. Here's a great verse, 2 Kings 19.30. We must dig down into the roots before we can bear fruit upward. We must take root downward before we can bear fruit upward. That's what Colossians 2 says, rooted and grounded in love, deepened in the Word of God. Desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby, if so be you have tasted the Lord is gracious. First Peter 2. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that someone come again and teach you which be the first principles of the oracle of God. Hebrews 5, 12 and following. Instead of launching out into the deep, Luke 5, 4, and going on into perfection, Hebrews 6, 1, some of my brethren are still in the shallow water and they never build upon the foundation. We need to preach more challenging sermons. We need to preach more textual sermons. We need to just open the Bible in every pulpit and study right from there. We need to indoctrinate brethren in the depths of spirituality. We need to put away habits that are unbecoming. Smoking. Brethren who defend social drinking. Brethren who allow their children to go to school dances. 
folk who still think that gospel preaching only means faith, repentance, confession, and baptism. We need to grow in spiritual depth, and then our numerical growth will be genuine and lasting, and we won't put up with Playtime USA anymore. We will demand preaching that steps on our toes and hits us all the way up the kneecap. It sends us out with our heads and hearts in the book, determined that never again will we know so little and serve so weakly that God can use us to make of his church on earth what it ought to be. Revelation 12, 11 is the key. They, the saints, overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of his testimony, and they considered not their own lives dear unto themselves. When you have that combination, the demons in hell tremble. And weak, unenlightened brethren come to attention. Church growth. It all comes when we give ourselves to God. Second Corinthians 8, 5. And if I were to choose just one verse that wraps it up, out of all the Bible, it would be Psalm 27, 4. There's a good verse to memorize. One thing have I desired of the Lord. One thing shall I strive after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And when we commit that to life, our neighbors can tell that we've been with Jesus too. Acts 4.13. And then you can't keep the church from growing in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.